continuing our series on um, warfare, what warfare, and uh, this morning's message is is really um, it's as I was just saying to the folks here, it's it's a spiritual secret, and it was a secret to me because I never read it in a book, I never saw it before, and it was I think it was one morning I, I woke up and God was just like He was just sharing with me something. And, and I'm like, I never saw this before. And it's right there in the Bible. Really, it's contained in two verses. But before I, before I read that, we're talking about spiritual warfare. And we want to win, right? And whether we like it or not, whether we, we are aware of it or not, we're all in a spiritual warfare. Whether uh, those are joining us through the internet, you know, uh, you may be an unbeliever, a complete atheist, and don't believe in God at all or a believer in Christ or any other religion, but you're in a warfare that's happening every single day. And and our enemy hates us. And, you know, people don't like to talk about this. And, you know, some people say, well, I don't believe that there's a devil. Well, that's, but some people don't believe that there's God either. You can't see God. I've never seen God. And I've never actually seen the devil, you know, but I've experienced both, <laughs> you know. And I think most people, if we, if we're, when we're quiet and we're alone, um, we can, we can, we kind of know in our hearts that there's what good and evil, right? And so God sent the answer, in complete, full answer, uh, to this earth about two thousand years ago in the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, "No man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him." God's Son, Jesus Christ. And it says of him, for this purpose was the Son of God manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And that word destroy means to loosen, to undo, to, to reduce to nothing. Right? Satan's three main categories are, are his M.O. is, according to Jesus, is to steal, to kill, and, to, and destroy. So when you see stealing, killing, and destroying in one form or another, Satan's behind it. And usually, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's through human beings. You know, I, I like to do studies and, and um, I like to watch biographies and I've also studied at length um, serial killers. You know, uh, and I watched one just this past week about a guy I'd never heard of from Germany. He was a notorious serial killer. He had killed somebody when he was quite young. Uh, I think he was 18 years old. He murdered a young woman. And he went to prison for an extended period of time. And he wrote a book in prison. And that book was published. And it appealed to intellectuals. Came out of prison and he became kind of a, you know, a celebrity, if you will. He paid his time to society, you know. and over the course of this time that he was out there in public, he was, he was murdering prostitutes. One after another, after another, after another. Many, many. I forget the figure that was there. And he was right there in a white suit, all glammed up, you know, and looking sharp. And, uh, you know, he finally got caught, as they always do. And... <clears throat> His lawyer was there. The jury was out. He was like Ted Bundy. He was he was trying to defend himself. He had a lawyer for sure, but he was trying to charm the 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 the, the jury with his you know he was kind of good looking and charming and charismatic you know. But people think that you know somebody that's demon possessed has looks like has you know uh, the the horns and a pitchfork and, and a tail, right? But that's not the case. Ted Bundy was very flamboyant, but these people were controlled by Satan by demonic power, you see? So Satan is real. But it, my point is is that he couldn't convince the jury, uh, but he was doing his best, and so he asked his lawyer afterwards. The jury went out to deliberate. Didn't look good, you know, and he would be sentenced to life. I don't think it was uh, the death penalty in Germany at the time. I'm not sure if there is now. But his lawyer said this to him. He said, the only thing you can do, he said, what can I do? He said, pray. He said, pray the Lord's Prayer. You know the Lord's Prayer. And you know, you look at this guy, and you could see him there, and they had him on video because they had recorded segments of the trial. And you could see him there talking with his lawyer. 
And you know what he said to his lawyer? He said, I can't. I can't. That's what he said. And his lawyers said, don't be ridiculous. The Lord's Prayer, everybody knows the Lord's Prayer. And his lawyer said, being interviewed afterwards, he said, I had insight into this man's character that this man could not utter the Lord's Prayer. Right? Because he had allowed demonic forces and powers of darkness to control him for so long that he was possessed. Um, he was sentenced to, to life in prison. The next day, he hung himself. And, and some people talked about it afterwards and said, um, that was probably the best murder that he ever did, was killing himself. Um, agree or disagree, whatever. It's a very sad case. Why am I talking about this? I'm talking about this because spiritual warfare is real. And that's, you know, one of the, you know, examples of it. But we see all kinds of examples. I don't believe anybody here or, you know, that I'm talking to is a murderer. It's a very small percentage of people that actually murder. But, you know, there's rapists, there's people, there's people that commit suicide. And a lot of them, they commit these horrific crimes. And how many times have you heard this? I heard a voice. Have you ever heard people say that? A voice told me to do it. I heard yeah. something. Mm -hmm. Happened in Moncton. You know, yeah. and I'm not talking about the, the murders of the police officers. No. I don't remember him hearing a voice. Yeah. But there was another guy that, that he said, I heard voices. Ambrose. What, what was it? Ambrose. The one that killed a friend of his playing cards. Oh, is it, was it? Is that right? I know one that was out Indian Mountain Way, but they were playing cards one night. And he said, he said that uh, the devil told him to do it. Right. Well, if there's many, because there was another one just maybe four years ago, yeah. and he had, he had, did have mental problems, but he said he heard his voice. Well, you know, the devil speaks, and, but God speaks. I'm not trying to scare you, but I mean, I'm trying to let you know that let's not be naive, right? And it's not just rapes, it's not just murders, but other areas. I'm telling you, God is not behind divorces, and I've been through more than one, you know? Uh, unfortunately, I chose to do these things. Sometimes you're the innocent victim. You know, I've been basically the both. <laughs> you know, what are places that I didn't... <laughs> you Amen. <know? laughs> Amen. Right? I, it's true. You know, I was the perpetrator of a divorce that should never have been, and, and I, was, I, was the, I was the person of being divorced. You know, and uh, it wasn't very fun on either side. I guess I reaped what I sowed, and then some. Uh, but, you know, I tell you, um, things that steal, child abuse, right? Where, you know, I, my father, you know, is alive and, and you know, I, I know he wouldn't like me to say this, but it's true, but he was a violent and came from a violent line of alcoholics. You know, the Rossiters had alcoholism way back, you know, and I was talking to somebody just past week that knew my great-grandfather, and I asked him, I said, was, was he an alcoholic? Yeah, yeah, he was, and there was violence in that family. You know, Jesus wasn't living there. They weren't building their house upon the rock, okay? And so, you know, there was abuse, and I was the recipient of child abuse. But you see, well, somebody says, well, how is that related to, to, the, to the devil? Well, there's, there's the forces of God and good and then there's forces of evil, right? Well, there's nothing evil in God. The Bible says God is light, and in Him there's no darkness at all, right? Mm -hmm. But human beings are, not can, they are influenced, and we're each influenced by the forces of good and evil every single day of our lives, right? And so this series that we're talking about warfare, what warfare, that's what I entitled it. Well, the reality is a lot of even times Christians and somebody sitting here, you know, going through a horrific spiritual battle and wanted to, you know, talk to people about this and feel like really Satan's really attacking her in this particular area. And they're like, I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about the devil. I don't want to talk about this. Right? Because it's negative. But whether you like it or not, there is a warfare going on every single day. And so how do we win? Is there a key? There is. There's several keys, really. But there's, there's a couple of primary ones. And, I mean, one obviously is being aware of it. You know, not knowing that you're in, in, in a battle. 
um, is, you know, you're, you're pretty much losing, right? You know, so you and me together in this world are going to face conflict in the spiritual world every minute of every day of our lives. And today we're going to talk about something, again, as a secret, but we, we, we address some foundational scriptures. We don't have time to read them today, but I want to read one of them. <clears throat> There's two foundational ones. <clears throat> Um, the one I'm not going to read, I'm just going to reference, is Mark chapter 4, verse 1 through 20. It's the parable of the sower. G Jesus said the sower sows the word. We're not going to read it, but Matthew chapter 7, um, and I'm going to read this so you guys don't have to turn here with me, but verse 24 through 27, and this is Jesus speaking. This is the last part of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 was the most incredible, powerful sermon that was ever made in the history of the world. And everybody, you know, most people have heard of it, believer or not believer, the Sermon on the Mount. You know, and we hear, you know, love your neighbors yourself. And, you know, uh, he just goes on and on and on. And it would take years to, and it, and it would literally take years to go through. You could spend a lifetime studying those, those verses and those principles. You could never exhaust it and never know and understand all that Jesus said in those three chapters, which is really not chapters. It's just a record of him and what he said. So at the very end of this great sermon, preaching to thousands of people, this is what he says. He says in Matthew 7, verses 24 through 27, he says it, and I'm reading from the Amplified, he says, So everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them, and that's the, we talked about this in other studies. Hearing God's word is, is, is great. We need to do that, but we need to obey it. Amen? Amen. Are you with me? Amen. Because if we hear and we don't do it, it doesn't help us. And remember, Jesus knew about the spiritual battle better than anybody else, right? So, so he knew what he was talking about. And so he, he, he goes and he says that if you obey them, you know what you're going to be like? You'll be like, uh, he's, this is what he says. He says, whoever hears these words of mine and acts upon them, obeying them, will be like a sensible, prudent, and practical, and wise man or woman who has built his house or her house upon the rock. You've heard that, right? The rock, solid foundation. And the rain fell. It's raining the past few days here in the Maritimes. And the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, yet it did not fall. Why? Because it had found it upon the rock, right? Now he says, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like, in the Amplified, it says, a stupid, foolish man or woman who has built his or her house upon the sand. And the rains fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great and complete was the fall of it. Great and complete was the fall of it, he says. So that's, that's final. That's pretty bad and so we have this life in this world and we, we, we're here we're now but we also have we're spirit being we're 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 a spirit soul and body animals have a soul and body like our little dog that's around here this morning Rocky he has a soul and he has a body and I'm telling you he is some happy when he sees mommy or Nana Joan you know, and uh, he just, the legs up in the air, and he's swung back legs and just smiling and just happy. Why? Because he has emotions, right? Uh -huh. He has a soul. But there's a difference. Did you know there's a difference? And what the difference is between an animal and a human being is that we have a spirit where, where we will live forever. And, you know, I believe there's animals in heaven, and I'm not going to say dogs don't, or pets <laughs> don't live forever because you'll write me bad letters. But, you know, we are a spirit being, and animals aren't. We con contact the spirit world, and, and we can contact the spirit realm, and we're aware of the spirit realm with our human spirit, right? And so we, we, we move in that realm, and at the same time we have our five senses, right? And then we move in the realm of the soul, which would be our mind, will, emotions, our intellect. And we can communicate. It would be our personality, right? But we, we, can, we pick up things in our spirit. 
and we can fellowship with God through our spirit if we have Christ in us. People that are, that are not Christian, and this is where the, divide, the dividing line goes. See, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, that's spiritual death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, God is eternal life. Jesus Christ is eternal life. See, when you look at Jesus, his express image of the invisible God, you saw a man, a Jewish man. And you would see, because his mother was Mary, but he didn't have a human father. God was his father. The blood that went through his veins was the blood of God, right? The, the, there was no conception uh, in, in Mary's womb from Joseph. The Bible says very, very clearly that he did not know her or have sexual relations with Mary until after Jesus was born. And then she did get pregnant and conceive and had more children. It's right there in the Bible. James, the brother of Christ. There's, he had several brothers and sisters. I forget how many. But Jesus was unique and different in that he was the only begotten son of God in that he was conceived supernaturally. The little egg inside of Mary was fertilized by the divine sperm, which the Bible says God, God, became flesh and dwelt among us. It says, great is the mystery of godliness. God became flesh. It says, God was in Christ. So when you looked at Jesus, you saw him. He was a spirit, soul, and, and body. But yet at the same time, he was there as God and man at the same time. The only person in history. He was almighty God and a human being. And he still is right now. And the blood that flowed through his veins is the blood that pays for our sins. And that's why he was on the cross, bearing our sins and taking the sins of the whole wide world. And so when you believe that and confess Jesus as your God and your Lord, you believe God raised him from the dead, then you become a born-again person. What, what does that mean? It means that the same life and nature that was in the man Jesus Christ, in his spirit, is, becomes comes in your spirit and you become a new creation you have in other words eternal life so here's the thing people that reject this message and say I don't believe that I've got my own religion and you got all that stuff religion doesn't save anybody here's the problem and we see this more and more and more and more and more today and we're gonna get to the spiritual secret in a minute but just so you understand there is a spirit world and so when people get into the New Age stuff, different kinds of religions, well, they come in contact. They become very still. Sometimes they'll fast, you know. People in every religion pray. They become quiet and they become, some religions they call it the over-self. Some people call, they'll say, you know, they refer to the subconscious mind. Well, it's your spirit. That's the part of you that lives forever. And your soul lives forever too. And so when they come in contact with the spirit world, talking about people that don't have Christ in them, their Holy Spirit's not inside of them, you come in contact with the spirit world and you get into this, you know, a true, true witches and true warlocks and true Satanists that are really into it, and people of other religions, New Age philosophies and stuff like that, they get into that, guess what happens? They come in contact with the spirit world and they can feel quite euphoric about it, but the more they get in there, and I've read books on this, one called The New Age Nightmare, this guy was right into it, you know, some of them will leave their bodies and astral project, you know, their spirit leaves their body for its time. They call it, there's different names that they call it. The spirit world is real, but the more they open themselves up to that, there is spiritual forces that they're exposed to, but they're demonic. They're, they're aware of the spirit realm, but they don't have eternal life, so they open themselves up to demonic power. And what happens is, the more they get into it, the darker it becomes. And of course, Satan, because he hates them, he'll, he'll do things. There's supernatural things that happen. Some people are amazed about psychics, you know. Some are, some are real psychics, some are just complete... Um, and all, most all of them, 99.9999, are in it for this. And sometimes big, big money. But, but either way, it's evil, and God condemns psychics. 
and the, the doing psychics. He loves the psychic, but hates what they're doing, the mediums. But some of the real ones, some of them that actually are tuned into the spirit world, well, they'll know things about your ancestors and know things about your comings and goings because demonic spirits reveal it to them. See, demons know what's going on. They know, you know, when you were born or your first and last name and where your address. So those demonic spirits whisper to the psychics, tell them specific information that only you'd know, and, they'd be, and then people are in awe of that and pay sometimes hundreds, thousands, and even sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars to these people that steal their money. But they're amazed that they know this information. Well, the devil knows this information. And so the demonic spirits, when there's a lot of them, these people are tuned into that. They can they tune in and they hear that. See, it's basically a, a, a mockery and a, a, um, uh, a counterfeit of the biblical fruit or a gifting of the spirit. There's three. There's the gift of the word of knowledge, the gift of the word of wisdom, and the gift of the discerning of spirits. Right? Gift of discerning of spirits. And they only happen when God wants it to happen. And God's used me sometimes in the gift of word of knowledge. I'll know something about some, some situation with somebody. I'll know something. But I can't just make that happen. That may not happen again for a year. But it, it'll be the Holy Spirit manifesting himself. And other people, you'll see it in great manifestation. They have a whole ministry along those lines. But the Holy Spirit in them reveals it to them as he wills. So the spirit realm, the spirit world is real. And so when we're in Christ Jesus, we're safe in that we're going to receive eternal life. But we're not safe in the sense that you're not going to be immune from spiritual attacks from the devil. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, somebody said, well, when, somebody asked one minister, he said, when, when am I going to stop being attacked by the devil so much? And he said, well, when you die. <laughs> you know, and the more that you move with God, and, and if you love God and you love people, and somebody said, I didn't really have any problems until I became a Christian. You know, there's no real thing. Once the devil, once you become a born-again Christian and get in the Word of God, you know, you have, you have a war on your hands because what did, what did we learn from the parable of the sower? What is Satan after? The number one thing. The, worst. the Word of God. Right? He says, you know, you seeds, so or so is the seed. Satan, when you hear the Word, and what did Jesus say? You hear the Word of God, right? But before it gets a chance to get root in you, it says the immediately the devil comes to steal it from you. Because it's the Word of God that will set you free from the powers of darkness, and it's an ongoing thing. And Jesus said this, and we can turn to the, the if you're all on that, that third page, we're going to go to our secret. And here's one major secret that is, that is something I didn't know. But Jesus said, if, if you continue in my word, then you're my disciples indeed. And that would be the written word of God, the Bible. He said, if you continue in my word, his words are recorded in there. This is God's word from Genesis to Revelation. He said, then you're my disciple indeed. And then he said, you're going to know the truth, and the truth will do what? Set you free. That's it. And as we continue to act on that, we will be more liberated. So, we're going to read this, this scripture, and the title of the message is How to Effectively Resist Satan. And of course, this is for Christians. And the first part of this, we, we talked about it, and we'll, we're going to pray later. If you haven't accepted Christ, then you're going to um, give, be given that opportunity. But um, we're going to read from 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9. And this, this is a secret that I never learned before. We're going to read from the Amplified Bible. And uh, I'm just going to read it to you. You, you can follow along. It says, and uh, they're, they're, I'm going to read verses 5 through 9 so you can see the verses before. It says, You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. And all of you, it says, clothe yourselves with what? Humanity. Or what is humility. it? Humility. That's right. <laughs> clothe yourself with humility toward one another. Isn't that something? It says, clothe yourself with humility toward one another. Now, what does it say? For God is 
opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, I don't know if anybody has another version, but we don't need to turn to it. It's okay. It says in another version, God resists the proud. Did you, did you know that? God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he says, and this is Peter, and I mean, I think Peter had, you know, and Peter would know this because Peter, I love Peter, uh, he had a big mouth, and uh, unfortunately he struggled with that. I get that from the Rossiters. If you knew my dad, you'd know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, if I say I'm John Rossiter's son, oh, that fella, you know, and of course he likes to talk. And my poor wife, I mean, you know, her thorn in the flesh is me because I tend to be an incessant talker. And uh, I try, and by the grace of God, I'm going to, you know, work on that area. But my personality type is much like Peter. Talk, 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 talk. So my wife has a signal, right? If I'm talking too much, she goes like this. <laughs> and I know what that means if we're in public and that or even with herself now I give her a new code word uh, she gave me a new code we agreed together if I'm talking too much because she's so pr she's pretty and she's right there beautiful but she's so courteous and she listens she's a great listener and she's turning red right now and you know so the new code word is if I'm talking too much you know because we all can, are guilty of it right we'll talk 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 because we got a lot on her mind, or if we've been through something, but she just and I asked her. I said, "Jenny, you will not hurt my feelings." But I said, "Sweetie, just say the word saturated." <laughs> That's it. If you say saturated, I'll know that means no matter how good what I may be saying, no matter how important it may be, no matter how scriptural and biblical it could be, right from the throne of heaven itself. He's really far. Yeah, yeah. The problem is that when she says it, I still keep going. And that's where I need to mind. I need to humble myself. Pardon me. Are you a Gemini? I don't know if I am, but I'm a gem. I like to think so sometimes, but it's an area I need to humble myself. So I'm confessing it really before you guys in the whole internet world, right? But when she says saturated. Um, you know, I need to to stop. So, but in public, it's this. And if she's upset, she's like really slow motion. <laughs> and I can think, okay, I've really gone overboard because this is a half an hour after she said it. You know, so I don't know, how did I get on that? <laughs> what was I talking about? Well, we we're talking about God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. I know what we're talking about. We're talking about Peter. We're talking about talking. See? It's a perfect example right there. And we get going. And But Peter wrote these verses. And how many remember the story? Uh, well, you know, it actually happened where Jesus was about this close from going to the cross. And Peter, like, and he told his disciples, he said, I'm, you know, I'm leaving. And, you know, I'm going to be taken by, by people. And I'm going to be crucified. He told them straight up. And... And, and he said, you guys are all going to forsake me. And Peter's like, not me. He said, I'm ready to go to prison. He said, I'm ready to die for you. That's what he said. Because he loved the Lord. He loved Jesus. But he was so quick to speak. He was always one to talk right, right away, right quick. You know, without thinking sometimes. And yet he became, and we know that he became the great apostle of the Lord. Because God worked in his life. And he's the one that wrote this. And we remember when Jesus spoke to him and said, Look, Peter, um, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And I bet Peter went, and he was silent. Because he knew Jesus, whenever he said something, was always right. But it was hard for him to fathom because he was, I believe he was very sincere. I'll die for you. And we know that story. So then Peter goes on and he writes this great book, 1 Peter and 2 Peter, and he says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. Remember, the Bible says God, remember Jesus said, you know, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. But it says, you know, um, 
he that exalts himself, Jesus said, will be humbled. And he that humbles himself will be exalted. Right? That's what Jesus said. So God will exalt you because, and, and if, we, if we want to go back to it, we don't have time. But who is the most proud person in the universe? Satan. Satan. Lucifer, the devil. Jen and I were talking about this yesterday. You know when he was in heaven, we don't know how long it was that he was created. But you know what? Could have been a thousand years, could have been a thousand days. We don't know. But it says of him, and you can read this in Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel 28, I believe. Those You'll find those verses in there. But in Isaiah 14, it talks about Satan. And it talks about him saying, I will. I will. I will do this. I will exalt my throne above the throne of God. I will be like the Most High. And you know, it says, I think it's in Ezekiel 28, it says, You are beautiful in all your ways until a day that was a spot was found in you. Talking about Lucifer, he's a beautiful creature. You know, talk about beauty and talent. Talented and glorious. You've heard of the angel Michael, right? Gabriel, you know, Christmas time he's... The blowing the trumpet. He'll be blowing the trumpet when Jesus comes. Lucifer was like that. And maybe more beautiful and more glorious than even both of them. And he was helping with the music and the direction of the worship. He was basically the worship leader in heaven. But there came a point in, in eternity where he was not satisfied. And guess what the first sin really that came into in existence was? And we're talking about this, remember, last night? I mean, and, and I don't know if it's necessarily the first sin, but it's coupled with something. But it was covetousness. I think that's the fruit of it, right? I think the first sin was pride. Because I think he looked in his mirror somehow and looked at himself and went, wow, you are something. I mean, I do that, but I don't really mean it. Okay? You know, I'm just kidding. You know, Jen builds up my self-esteem, especially as I grow older and gray hair. But, you know, that's what the devil did. Lucifer. He looked at himself and went, wow, you're amazing. But he was like, I am. And what's the, what's the, what's the middle letter of the word pride? I. Yeah. And so he looked at himself and went, wow. I am amazing, I am talented, I am gifted, I am beautiful, I am so handsome. I am amazing, I'm glorious. And it says he got lifted up in his pride. And he conceived for the first time a thought that was against the will of Almighty God. He conceived something that said, I'm going to be like the Most High. I'm going to exalt my throne above his throne. I'm not going to be sitting here for the rest of the time in eternity worshiping and serving him. And it began to grow in him and said his spot was found in him. And all of a sudden, and I, want, I like to see Mel Gibson or some great movie maker make a movie about this thing that happened in heaven. Because you imagine he wasn't content. All of a sudden he rises up this ugly, ugly pride and he wasn't content with just saying, I want to be worshipped. Now he's going like this, I want you to follow me. I don't know how long it was, but it's, it is, and most scholars agree, that a third, a third of the angels that were in heaven said, listen to him, and said, okay. And there was a rebellion in heaven. Can you imagine that? They're at the throne of God. They're in heaven. Some people think, don't ever get to a place in your life where you think that you're so spiritual and you just know God so well that you couldn't fall all the way to hell. Amen? Mm -hmm. He was in heaven, wasn't he? Right? Adam and Eve were in paradise and they didn't have a sin nature and they fell. Right? <laughs> Peter, James, and John had the greatest pastor in the world. Jesus Christ for three and a half years and they did deny him and they did fall short but but worse than that they rep they repented thank God worse than that who completely denied him and betrayed him Judas. Judas. right 
Could we blame Jesus for that? He had the best pastor, the most loving man, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, and Judas betrayed him up close and personal, didn't he? Right? Betrayed him with a kiss. So let us never get to that place. So Satan was and is the absolute epitome of pride. Jesus says about Lucifer, he was a murderer from the beginning, and he did not abide or remain in the truth. Because there's no truth in him. The devil is a liar. liar. It's, Jesus said when he speaks a lie, he speaks of himself, because he is a liar and the father of it. In other words, he's the father of lies. And it started in heaven. It's hard to imagine. That's why I would love to see a, a really well done movie of this rebellion that took place. A third of the angels, folks. One out of three. And they knew God. They could see him on his throne. They, but what? They were deceived. They were deceived. And guess what? Any one of us can be deceived. I've been deceived. We've all been deceived. The Bible says that the God of this world, which is Lucifer, has blinded the minds of those who do not believe, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. The devil is deceiving the world right now. Most people are not born again Christians. And Satan deceives them and blinds their minds so that they reject Christ or don't accept Christ or won't follow Christ with all of his lies to take them where he's going, which is hell and eternity, separation from God. I don't have time to, to go into a lot of detail about this. I have a new message going. I was doing something the other day. Jen and I were on our way out, and downstairs in the laundry room with the heat just blasting, I had forgotten one of my, my blankets outside. It was wet, and I had to put it in the dryer, and, and I hung it up, and water went everywhere. I think it was water from the washing machine. We've had a lot of water problems, you know? And, you know, no matter what you may be going through, this is just a preface of a message that, I, that I've got brewing. Just, just bear with me for one minute. You know, the devil was right there trying to torment me and vex me. I was hot and bothered. See, the devil, whenever you have a, maybe a financial, marital problem, whatever may problem that really irks you, makes you full of anxiety and makes you angry, or can make you angry if you choose to, right? Because nothing can make us angry. Although anger is not a terrible thing if you're angry at the right thing, right? I'm angry at child abuse, aren't you? Right? Or angry at abortion. I hate abortion. Right? I'm angry at, at people that, that rape and pillage other people and steal and rob from them, and we should be. Jesus got angry. But, you know, when you're angry, right, and the devil's right there taunting, and I stopped right up because I really wasn't getting mad, but I could just feel like that, you know. And all of a sudden, I basically got all cocky, and I'm like, oh, yeah? So I thought, okay, Mr. Devil, that's fine. You're going to sit here and try to harass me and vex me, because I'm going to be inconvenienced to clean up this mess for maybe half an hour while my wife's waiting upstairs, enjoy the rest of our evening together. But I thought, listen, I may be here for 15, 20 minutes with a red face and cleaning up this mess. You're going to be burning for eternity in hell. How does that feel, mister? He shut right up. Shut right up, right? I'm reminding him of where he's going. So when the devil comes at you, because Jesus one time was casting demons out of this man, and these demons spoke right up, and they said, are you come to torment us before the time? And Jesus cast the demons out of him. So my new message is going to be, yeah, I'm here to torment you before the time. And you know how you torment the devil? When he's bugging you, when he's harassing you, go, yeah, you know what? This, this is a temporary trial. I'm going to get through this. God's going to help me. I'm not always going to feel bad, but you're going to feel bad for the rest of eternity in a place called hell. <laughs> Who's feeling bad now, Mr. Devil? Yeah, right? Amen. I'm here to torment you now, Mr. Devil. Amen. My wife's laughing over here. But I got that sermon. I can't wait to preach it. But you know, he led those people. And what was the root of their sin again? It was pride. Pride. And what was Jesus? The absolute opposite. Remember in the garden? His disciples had left him. They, they, well, they, they were... They, they, actually, they didn't. Three of them were there with him. Peter, James, and John. What were they doing? Anybody? They fell asleep. They, were sleeping. they totally fell asleep. It was late. 
And they're tired. And he woke them up. You know, could you guys not watch with me? And he was going through agony. Remember, it says that even the, he sweat great drops of blood. He was under such pressure. And what was he praying, basically? What was he praying when he was, he was praying in that garden and he, was, and he knew what was at stake and what was he praying? Oh, Father, if it's possible to take this cup away from me. Remember that? And he was under such duress and stress and, and, and such awesome pressure that it's the little capillaries in the temple break open. If you're under that much stress and you sweat mingle with blood, it says, he sweat great drops of blood. If it's possible, but he said what? Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. And he prayed that prayer three times, didn't he? Remember that? Humility. And it says of Jesus Christ, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We're not going to turn to it, but Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through, I think, 9 it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Amen? And then the next verse says, Wherefore also God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee shall bow in heaven, earth, and hell. And there's going to come a time in the future where Lucifer is going to bow as well. He's going to be forced to bow to the humble one. Pride is going to bow to humility one day. And that's why Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are, are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And what Satan coveted and lusted for so desperately, Jesus was exalted to the right hand of God Almighty. You see? And so what does it say in these verses? It says, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Now look at this. Be of a sober spirit, be on the alert, be on the alert, why? Because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a what? Roaring. Like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Or to steal, kill, and destroy from. Steal, kill, and destroy. But what does it say? But resist him, firm in the faith. We're starting to close now. Resist him, firm in your faith knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Resist him firm in your faith. Okay, we're going to go to James chapter 4. I'm reading from the Amplified, verses 6 through 7. Now watch this carefully, please, because you're going to learn something that I thought was incredible. It says in James 4, verse 6, but he gives us more and more grace. The power of the Holy Spirit. God gives us the power and desire to do the will of God. Grace is not just the undeserved or unmerited favor of God. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is an acronym. God's riches at Christ's expense. It's also the power of His presence in our life to meet this evil tendency and others as well. In other words, the tendency to what? To walk in pride. The tendency to sin. The tend to be, tendency to be in rebellion. That is why he says, what? God sets himself, or resists, God sets himself against the what? Proud and haughty? Yes. God resists or sets himself against the proud and haughty, but what does he do? He gives grace. He gives grace continually to the lowly, those who are humble enough to receive it. Amen? Amen. Amen? Those who are humble enough to receive it. God sets himself against the proud and the haughty. Why? Because pride and haughtiness is the very character and nature of Satan himself. So God goes like this. No. 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 He resists actively. No. And 
if pride is manifesting in us, God's like, I love you. God doesn't love the devil. He hates Lucifer in every respect. He's unredeemable, and his choice is irrevocable. He is going to hell with all of his demons forever, and everybody that refuses Christ and rejects the gospel will be going with him. But it says, God sets himself against the proud. And people say, well, that's an awful, harsh, indicting, and damnable statement that you just made. Jesus said this, except you be converted and become like a little child, you shall not inherit, or you shall not enter. That's right. The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. You knew that, eh, Phyllis? Yes, I did. Yeah. See? You shall not inherit. What does it say? Except you be converted and become like a little child. Well, isn't that a kind of a beautiful reflection of innocent humility? Mm -hmm. And that's what the Lord is looking for in adults. And some people are too proud to accept Christ. They don't want him because they think, oh, I gotta, I'm not going to accept this. You know, They want their sin more than they want salvation. They're just blinded and deceived by the devil because they don't really know their end. If people really knew that they were going to go to hell, they'd be running to Jesus Christ right now. Mm -hmm. But the gospel is the power of God that we're sharing to, to take the blinders off that Satan's put on them to remove them. They can see, oh my goodness, there's Jesus on the cross with my sins and my salvation is in him and you accept him and you become you know, an inheritor of eternal life. God sets himself against the proud and haughty but gives grace continually to the lowly, those who are humble enough to receive it. So James says, like Peter, so be subject to God, then what? Resist the devil, stand firm Amen. against him. And then what will happen? He will flee you from, he will flee from, from you. Right? And that's what Peter said, right? Your adversary, the devil, comes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, seeking whom he may steal, kill, and destroy. Right? But it says, but resist him in the faith. Right? Mm -hmm. Resist him in the faith. Right? And what does it say? Right here in James, it says, right? Sub, so be subject to God, and then what? Resist the devil. Stand firm against him. He says it again. Now here's my question. And here is, don't worry about that at all. There is an amazing principle here as we close. And I want you to please get it because it's something that will never change. How can you resist the devil if God is resisting you? Humble yourself. Yes. That is the, yes, but how can you resist the devil if God's resisting you? Think about that. That's what I got that morning, that day, four or five years ago. I never heard that before in my life. And then he gave me the scriptures in Peter and John. And I was like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. And I began to think about that. And I've been thinking about it for the past five years. And I want you guys to think about it now. How can you resist the powers of darkness, a being that's so powerful to deceive most of the populace of earth? To completely surrender yourself to God? Right, but, but, but think about this. I want you to think about it from this context. If God is resisting you, how can you resist the devil? Anybody have an answer? Humble yourself? No. The answer is, think about the question. How can you resist the devil if God is resisting you? It's a one-word answer. Courage? Uh, excuse me. It's a two-word answer. No. No. How can you resist the devil if God is resisting you? If God is resisting you, how can you resist the devil? Two words. Peace and confidence. You can't. <laughs> it was a trick question. <laughs> right? oh. It's impossible. There's even better. That's even better. It's impossible. Why is it impossible? Well, because it says God resists the proud. So how can you resist supernatural satanic power and spiritual forces of wickedness when, when the power of Almighty God Himself 
is resisting you personally. And yet you want to resist the most powerful being outside of Almighty God in the universe. He's deceiving the whole planet. And yet you or me want to resist the devil, this, this powerful being. What? By barking at him? By, by yelling? Get away from me! By, you know, you can quote scripture, which Jesus said, it is written. Amen? But if we're walking in pride in whatever area, good luck. Why? Why? Because God's resisting us. Right? Does that make sense? You guys follow yeah. me? Yeah. You see that? Yeah. Well, I thought God loved me. Well, he does. He loves you more than you can imagine. But how is it that, well, because you're walking in pride. So God's going, talk to the hand. The Bible talks about God's ears are closed to the wicked, right? And so pride, being the nature of Satan, manifested in us will cause God to go, no, no, I love you, but I can't go like this. I'm sorry. I'm resisting you right now. So, I'm going to ask you again. How can you resist the devil if God is resisting you? You can't. Yeah. You can't. What if you know the Bible? Backwards and forwards. It doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. What if you go to church? Doesn't matter. Doesn't what if you matter. give a lot of money to the church? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. What if you pray? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. The are closed. Unfortunately, it's a spiritual reality because it says... God sets himself against the proud. Right? Why? Because it's the nature of the devil. And God's not going to be embracing the nature of the devil. See? It's sin. So is there a remedy? And of course, I pressed you guys, but you guys kind of gave me all the remedy, Kimmy. You said two or three things. What did you say? I read your little sheet here. <laughs> <laughs> you read a sheet. You said something. Peace and confidence. And right? But what do, what do we need to do? I had to humble yourself. Yeah. Oh, yes. humble yourself. So how does that manifest? Want me to tell you one way? Admit when you're wrong. Admit when you're wrong. And not just to God. When I'm wrong to my wife, I tell you something. I just don't go to God and say, Lord, forgive me for being a chatty Johnny and just really, you know, exasperating her, her level of patience. You know, or if I say something wrong to her. Just because I'm, I'm busy or I think, well, okay, I could be curt with her. Or just to hurt her feelings in some way. Mm -hmm. What do I do, Jen, when if I hurt you or do something wrong? Apologize. Pardon me? You apologize. I apologize. I go to her and I ask her to forgive me and I name what I did. Yeah. Right? I, t I, I recognize that. Well, that's an act of humility. I'm confessing my sin and I ask the Lord to forgive me and he forgives me. And guess what? God gives me grace. Right? I get forgiveness from her. I get forgiveness from God. The, the, the blood of Jesus cleanses me of my sin. And I'm back in good standing again. I mean, if I have to sleep on the couch for a night, so what? <laughs> Just kidding. It doesn't make me ever sleep on the couch. Ever. But, you know, God gives grace. I mean, he gives power. So if I'm struggling in an area, I want to give you, and we're, we're going to close. I know you guys... We've been a long time here, but I want to share something with you that's critical, that is missing in, in, the, in the body of Christ. And we see it in AA. We see it in the different um, help groups, but we don't see hardly any of it in the church as much as we should. And that's accountability for an area where you're weak. Why? Because of pride. People say, well, it's because I'm so ashamed. I bet you it's more pride than shame a lot of the time. True. Right? Yep. I don't want to admit that I have a problem watching porno. I don't want to admit that I have a problem with lust. I don't want to admit that I have a problem with overeating. I don't want to admit that I have a problem swearing. I don't want to admit that I have a problem stealing and lying and gossiping. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Right? I don't want to admit that I don't hardly ever pray. Well, I'm spiritual. Pastors, ministers, we don't want to admit 
because I'm the pastor, I'm a spiritual leader. So, Lucifer was a spiritual leader in heaven. Look what happened to him. You gotta humble yourself. You gotta get accountability, which means this: you go to somebody, don't have they don't nobody, none of us are perfect, and say, I've got a problem. I've got several men that every week I, I I text them or Facebook them and I ask them how their week was, and some of them have different kinds of problems and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And I ask them how their week was and they let me know. They had a good week, I know. What, what I mean, if they didn't have a good week, they'll say, well, I fell short. And we'll pray together. But there's an element of humility that goes with accountability that you cannot get. You can pray, you can read the Word, you can study, you can, you can, you can go to church for, for, you know, seven days a week. But you will not get grace to overcome that sin and that weakness be, without admitting it to another person and being accountable every single week. Sometimes every day, you know, there's guys that watch pornography every day of the week and it affects their job and women too, not as much, but it affects their job, they're, they're, they're on it at work and they're just losing themselves in the world of porn. It's a problem that's all over the place, yeah. right? And guys, guys I'm talking to, you, you know, reach out to a guy, another man and say, look, I got a problem with this. And I can guarantee you, you stay faithful and you be honest. If you fail, you will see yourself get better and better and better and better and better. Why? Because God gives grace to the humble. And as an act of humility, you're saying, well, i got a problem. And that's with AA. That's why they have a lot of success. They change some things. AA was founded on the 12 steps. The 12 steps is founded in Scripture. I know people know that and say higher power, like a light bulb. Well, you know, my higher power is Jesus Christ. You know, and I know that if I humble myself, not just before him, but if I humble myself before you, say, Phyllis, I, I have a problem talking too much. It's an area where I need you to pray for me. And the Bible says this, and I'm going to close with this scripture. It says, confess your faults one to another, in James, pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman avails much. In other words, I'm going to confess one to another, pray one for another. There is an element of trust that needs to be there. You need to confess your, your areas of weakness to the right person. It needs to be somebody that you, you trust and believes that loves you and cares about you. Right? So find one person. You don't need ten. Myself, I want five, six, seven people besides my wife that I can be accountable to. Because I'm a minister. Our church is growing. I don't want to be left out here. I'm being attacked all the time. Devil's coming up at me in every direction. Right? And I've already fallen. You see? I've already fallen in all these areas. And I know what it's like to be almost completely destroyed. And by the grace of God, by the grace of God, I'm alive and I'm doing what I'm doing today. Amen. I would be ruined, right? Ruined. Mm -hmm. But I humbled myself. Remember the prodigal son? And he was in the yeah. pig pen, yeah. you know, and he's like, it's better. And he's like, you know what, my father, if I go back there, maybe he'll just take me in as a servant. Yeah. Maybe. But instead, we, but see, what was that? An act of humility. Amen. Mm -hmm. In his heart, he's like, maybe he'll just take me back. I've done so wrong. I tell you, God will take you back. And God will love on you. If you repent, you humble yourself. And God, it says that he will give you grace. Amen. Yeah. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sin, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, yeah. right? And the most and greatest and most important step you can ever make, and we're going to pray this right now because we're closing, I'm going to give you an opportunity to, to pray a prayer, a confession. If you haven't confessed Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please humble yourself now and become like the little child, right? So that you can enter the kingdom of God. We need Jesus as our Savior. That's the first admission. I cannot save myself, and I know it. Amen? And that's why you're humbling yourself, right? And because you become, become like a little child in your heart. Jesus is your Savior. He's Almighty God. So you pray this prayer with me, and then we're going to pray a prayer for the Christians afterwards that are struggling. And we're going to believe God to help us in, in the respect to receiving the grace of God so that we can overcome and, and, and effectively resist the devil. In Jesus' name. 
So let's let's pray this prayer. And this is if you've never prayed this prayer, I want you to say it with all your heart. You're watching my internet. Dear God in heaven. Dear God, dear God in heaven. Thank you for your love for me personally. Thank you, Thank you for your love for me personally. You love me, you love me before, I before I was born. And before I was born, you sent Jesus to die on the cross for me. To take my sins, to take my shame, to take my guilt, to take me on the cross and be punished for my sins. I was punished in him. The debt has been paid. Because of the blood of Jesus, my sins have been paid for. I confess Jesus as my Lord. I confess him as my God. Right now, I believe in my heart, although I don't see it, Although I don't see it, that God raised him from the dead. That God raised him from the dead. Three days after he died. Three days after he died. And that he's alive right now. And that he's alive right now. He still has those holes in his hands and feet. He still has those holes in his hands and feet. And the scar in his side. And the scar in his side. Because of my sin. Because of my sin. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. You are my Lord. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. You are my Savior. And right now. I thank you for eternal life. When my body dies, I shall go to heaven forever. I didn't earn it, but I humbly accept the free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now let's stay in an attitude of prayer as well, because we're going to pray right now for people, and we all struggle, that are struggling with sexual addiction, food addiction, alcohol addiction, addictions uh, to sex, of uh, adultery, different kinds of things. Uh, people that are bound by lust for, for money, and workaholics, any kind of holic, drug addicts or whatever, and we're going to pray right now for each one of us, okay? Father God, right now in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for your love for us. You didn't stop loving us, Lord, with all of our problems. You love us right now while we're addicted. You love us right now today while we struggle with sin. And so, Lord, we pray, Father God, that you'd forgive us for the sins that we've just mentioned. Lord, we've sinned against you by watching pornography. We've sinned against you by being in fornication and adultery. We've sinned against you by being alcoholics. We've sinned against you by reaching out to other things to try to comfort our soul. We've reached, we've reached out to things, Lord, that are idols, and we ask you to please forgive us, Lord. We ask you to cleanse us from all of our sins and wash us by your blood. And Lord, we pray, Lord, for the people that are here and the people that are watching online, that they would find someone that they trust, that they can admit that they're struggling, Lord, and receive grace and empowerment from heaven, the supernatural ability to overcome sin and self and Satan. And Lord, we ask you to, to just minister grace right now to each one of us, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to wash us by your precious blood. Holy Spirit of God, fill us up to overflowing, we pray. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for helping us, Lord, one day at a time, sweet Jesus. That's all we're asking of you, Lord, to give us the strength to do every day what we need to do. Yesterday's gone, and tomorrow may never be mine. But for thy sake, teach us to take one day at a time. And Lord, so we humbly accept your grace today, admitting we can't do it on our own. We're too weak. Like the disciples that fell asleep at the most critical hour in the life of Jesus, when he asked, could you not pray with me an hour? He said, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And then you asked us, Lord, to pray. And that you said that, Lord, that you would. And we will pray this prayer together together let us pray the Lord's Prayer 
our Father, our Father which, art in heaven, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy, name. Thy, thy kingdom come. Thy, kingdom come thy, will be done, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. And we forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. For thine is the kingdom. The power and the glory. The power and the glory. Forever and ever. Forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Thank you Lord. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for joining us today. And if you've asked the Lord in your life for the first time, please reach out to us either through uh, the YouTube video or wherever you may have seen it, um, and or Facebook. You can reach out to myself or my wife, Jen. And we just want to thank you for, for tuning in. We pray that you've helped us. We're actually concluding our series on spiritual warfare, and we're going to be picking up on another topic next week. So God bless you, and remember this, God loves you, and so do I.